Right. So let's get started. Okay. Okay. So uh, you have we are to along with Dr. Gurudev uh, and me, Limbi will uh, take us through the uh, anesthetic concerns and anesthetic management of a patient with a cleft palate. Yes, sir. Huh? Yes, sir. Okay. Go ahead. You can present your case, uh, yes, Limbi. Sir. Okay. Uh, good afternoon all. Today I'm presenting a case on cleft palate. So uh, the informant uh, was mother and the history was reliable. It was a 10 month old male child with history of nasal regurgitation while feeding and recurrent ear infection. Child had frequent episodes of upper respiratory tract infection and was given <laughs> antibiotics and nebulization for the same and was never hospitalized in the past. There was no relevant family history. Birth history, the mother had no history of any drug intake or infection during the pregnancy. Uh, the baby was full term, uh, born by a lower segment cesarean section uh, with birth weight of 2.8 kg, passed urine and meconium within 24 hours, and there was no other congenital anomalies detected at birth. Feeding history, child was given breast milk since birth and weaning started at the age of six months. He has difficulty in sucking and nasal regurgitation of milk and weaning food. Child is fed with palida. Immunization history, child was immunized for the age and the developmental milestones, child uh, can stand with support, immature pinger gas was there, waves bye-bye and utters mama. General physical examination, child was playful and febrile at the time of examination. His length was 75 centimeter, weight 8 kg and head circumference was 42 centimeter. There was no pallor, no cyanosis and no edema. Vital signs, heart rate was 110 uh, per minute. Saturation was 100% uh, in the room, uh, room air. BP was uh, 80 by 50 millimeter of mercury and the respiratory rate is 28 per minute. On the airway examination, there was a left unilateral cleft in the soft palate, approximately two centimeter, which is seen in the roof of the oral cavity. And all of the uh, systemic examination was within normal limit. These are the investigations of the child and the echocardiogram study was normal and the coagulation profile was also normal. So uh, summary of uh, the case, a 10 month old term baby born by lower segment cesarean section with a birth weight of 2.8 kg. There is no history of ICU admission or other congenital anomaly. Presented with a unilateral cleft palate with history of nasal regurgitation and recurrent ear infection. No history of developmental delay or uh, no history of lower respiratory tract infection requiring hospital admission. Immunized for, uh, immunized for age with a weight of 8 kg now. On examination, there was a left unilateral cleft in the soft palate, approximately 2 cm seen in the roof of oral cavity, and the uh, child was admitted to the hospital for palatoplasty surgery. Diagnosis, it is a left unilateral cleft palate with normal milestones with no other, con no other congenital anomaly seen. Okay, that's a very good summary, Limbi. Yes, sir. Uh, especially when you're presenting a short, a short case, the examiners expect you to present the whole thing within two to three minutes. Okay, so that then we can continue with the discussion. Can you go back to your first slide and then we'll go step by step as we discuss this case. Okay, yes. so you mentioned here uh, that, you know, that it's a 10 month old child. Okay, and uh, there are frequent episodes of upper respiratory tract infection. Now, very often children come with a runny nose, right? Yes, sir. Yes, so sir. how do you differentiate an infective runny nose from a non-infective runny nose because you labeled it as upper respiratory tract infection. Yes, sir. What what if I say it was only just a watery discharge, not an infection? It's quite common in pediatric age groups. So how do you dissociate these two? Because the implications are quite different, right, Limbi? Okay, yes, sir. Huh. From the history, uh, if the uh, discharge, the nasal discharge is foul smelling or uh, if it is associated with any fever or productive cough, like uh, associated lower respiratory tract infection also. And from the investigation, if the total count value is high, more than 10,000 per ml, then it is suggested or uh, if on examination, uh, like the uh, in the chest, there will be crepitations, then it can be, the uh, surgery can be postponed for two to three weeks because the child is having an active infection that can result in post-operative respiratory complication. Suppose a mother says that, you know, a week ago I came to uh, the MOS hospital, child was treated for an upper respiratory infection one week ago. Now the child is able to asymptomatic. Okay. When yes, can you sir. take up? What is the earliest you can take up this case? Then? Three weeks, after three weeks. Two more, we need to wait for two more weeks so, so that the airway become less one reactive. Week after, the, after the treatment is over, the child is asymptomatic. Yes, sir. So you will wait for another three weeks, is it? Two weeks, sir. Two weeks. So what are the recommendations? Uh, two to three weeks after uh, an active infection. What happens, the... if you, what happens if you take up before that? 
like the uh, uh, respiratory tract is overreactive so there will be more chance for post operative uh, bronchospasm fine that's good okay so very often you know we are faced with this problem of differentiating an infective from a non infective uh, you know a nasal discharge and i think you've described it uh, quite well right now you also talked about uh, uh, okay go on to the next slide uh, and then sir in the meantime sir usually uh, yes, yes sir doctor the examiners do ask why after a respiratory infection the child becomes uh, the airway becomes hyperreactive what is the reason because you said that 3 weeks you have to postpone why 3 weeks why not 2 weeks why not 6 weeks uh, so that secretion and all uh, the uh... now what happens is whenever there is a infection especially a bacterial or viral infection the vagal nerve endings they become you know hypersensitive so any stimulation of the upper airway so release of more release of acetylcholine and acting on the m3 receptors bronchospasm so this is common uh, thing and this hypersensitivity of uh, the respiratory tract will take almost about 3 weeks the nerve endings to disappear so that is the reason usually they say 6 weeks but even 3 weeks is enough because the sensitivity would have come down drastically Sorry to interrupt, sir. In this, no, no, no. You are absolutely right. I'm uh, glad you pointed out that four to six weeks is the ideal duration. Yes. But then, when a child is having frequent infections like this, then we have to find the right window period to operate. Otherwise, it will just carry on like that. Okay. Yes. So now, um, uh, on this slide, is there anything specific you would like to point out? Uh, the, there was a uh, in the feeding history the child had uh, difficulty in sucking and nasal regurgitation of milk and the weaning fluid from the uh, since birth. So that will result in that resulted in recurrent uh, infections. Okay, let me. What is the what is the ideal age at which uh, cleft palate is repaired and why? Uh, cleft palate is usually repaired when the child is at ten months of age. This is because before the development of the speech. Ideally, the cleft palate should be corrected before the development of the speech. Okay. Uh, with and also how, the. How about the lip? I know we're not uh, don't have a lip deformity in this child. But suppose this child had come with an isolated cleft lip. It should be corrected at least by ten. Yes, sir. It should be corrected before ten weeks. Uh, this is because uh, if if the child is only having cleft lip, then that will uh, that will also help in the uh, like sucking uh, feeding uh, of the baby, because cleft lip will result in difficulty in feeding, and that will result in fa uh, failure to thrive. Okay. So will early it, correction is better. Okay, Nimbi, wait. Will it yes. result in difficulty in breastfeeding or difficulty in bottle feeding? uh this 10 weeks uh, is is linked to that particular uh, period okay so very often yeah. what happens is when the child starts getting weaned off mm -hmm. mother's uh, breastfeed yes, that's yes. when they will start putting on bottle feeds yes the yes. child will not be able to get suck properly from a bottle yes. whereas with the breast the child is able to get an adequate you know uh, seal and it won't be much of a problem to breastfeed very often the mothers and the babies learn the trick So the right method of breastfeeding. Yes. So lip alone, you know, is not a major problem for breastfeeding. But when it switches to bottle feed, that's the problem. That's the time you will need, probably need to correct it. Okay. Yes. Have you heard of a rule called the rule of ten? You know, yes, very sir. often we talk about that. What is that? Yeah. In cleft lip, uh, the cleft lip should be corrected with uh, with the baby of ten weeks age, ten uh, uh, pounds weight, and when the hemoglobin is ten gram per deciliter, and when the total count value is less than ten thousand per ml. For the cleft palate, it should be corrected when the baby's weight is 10 kg, uh, with a 10 month age uh, baby uh, with a hemoglobin of 10 gram per deciliter, and when the total count is less than 10,000 per ml. So, uh, Limbi, what is the name of uh, this rule of 10? Any name is there? Somebody's name? It's called as Killer's rule of 10. Killer. Killer. Okay. And uh, Limbi, one more question here because you said that 10 weeks and 10 months. Why can't uh, both the surgeries to be done by ten ten weeks? Why do you want to wait for? Because anyway, before the speech, the child starts speaking. You'll have to do the palate surgery. You said, but why not together by ten weeks or before ten weeks? Why should you wait for a, a child to grow till ten months to do a palate surgery? Uh, after the correction of the cleft lip, the width of the cleft, uh, the uh, palate defect will reduce. So. No. You want the tissue also to mature, right? 
limbing. You want the tissues to mature. Tissues, see, it's very difficult to operate in the depths of the mouth when you know the uh, tissues are still very fragile and young. So the surgeon also prefers to put it off a while till the tissues become a bit more. They grow a bit more, and then they be able to mobilize and approximate. Sorry, Guru, that I answered your question. I'm so sorry. And one more thing, sir, mind? lip surgery is a minor surgery. Correct. So even uh, first week, second week, even as a neonate also, it can be done. You need not have to wait even for uh, ten weeks. But palate surgery is a major surgery wherein the, you know quite a bit of blood loss also occurs. That is why it is better for the child to grow a little bit more so that it can tolerate this major surgery for that infant. So that is the reason. And as such, sir was telling about the tissue growth also. So these are the two reasons why you have to wait. You don't do together both the surgeries, right? Let me, you have written on this uh, slide, no history of drug intake or infection during pregnancy. Do you want to narrow down to one particular part of pregnancy? Is it throughout? Let's say that your mother had fever. First trimester. First trimester. First trimester. First trimester. Please narrow it down some more. There's a period of organogenesis. Four to eight weeks. Four to eight weeks time. Four to eight weeks. Four to eight weeks. Okay. Right. Even you can extend it a bit more, four to ten weeks or so. Okay. So it's basically 30 to 70 days. Diagnosis and uh, uh, cleft lip and cleft palate occur as a result of uh, maldevelopment or disordered development of which part during embryology? Uh, the maxillary process, fusion of the maxillary process with the medial uh, nasal process, and uh, the. Okay, right. So it's also the branchial arches, and uh, we will come to. Uh, you written here no other congenital anom anomalies. What are the common congenital anomalies associated? Usually, the uh, child with cleft palate will have Pierre Robin syndrome and Treacher Collins syndrome and all. So, they will have micronathia, glossotosis, uh, cardiac anomalies. And in uh, Treacher Collins syndrome, there will be coenal atresia or ear or eye malformations. Okay. So, we need to rule out all these congenital anomalies. Well, in any syndrome, what are you going to look for? No other, are you just going to label it as Treacher Collins or Pierre Robin or are you going to look for any cardiac anomalies? <laughs> yes, Correct. precisely. We need to look for cardiac anomalies, right? Because again, part of the heart develops from the branchial arches, right? So that's why you need to know a bit of embryology. So along with the you know, deformity of the face, you also get associated problems with the cardiovascular system. And that's the reason CVS must be very carefully evaluated. Okay, of course, syndromic children have other issues as well. And uh, thank you for enumerating Fischer Collins and Peter Robin syndrome. Okay, uh, Guru, you have any questions on this slide or you want to proceed a bit further? Yeah, um, one more thing is uh, many of the syndromes are associated, isn't it? Not just uh, Piri Robin or uh, Treacher Collins, even Clipple Field is there and uh, you know, um, especially Catch-22 is one of the um, um, uh, congenital uh, syndrome that can be associated. So all these syndromes, many are even Down syndrome may be associated with left lip palate. So you may be asked about all these syndromes, individual syndromes and their uh, uh, you know, anesthesia problems associated with. So you just have to know about all the syndromes associated with left lip palate. Right, sir? Okay, so let's go on to the uh, next uh, next slide. And then that's, uh, okay, immunization is fine. Okay, milestones are good. Right, so let's say this child is now being scheduled at 10 months of age for cleft uh, palate repair. Okay, and uh, the child doesn't have uh, an infective uh, etiology for the nasal discharge. Put up the last slide where we had the, uh, you know, the investigations. Essentially, they were all looking normal, right? Yes, sir. All investigations are normal. So with this kind of an investigation profile and uh, you've seen the child, uh, how would you prepare this child for a uh, cleft palate surgery? Any, any uh, so, preparation? So uh, during the uh, pre-anesthetic checkup, we need to take a detailed history uh, like I uh, took uh, and also uh, look into the investigations, whether they are normal and are, uh, do a blood grouping and RH typing, especially for the cleft palate uh, baby uh, and arrange blood for the same. Uh, and uh, then uh, we need to uh, do an echocardiogram uh, if the on examination, if there is any murmur. And uh, we need to talk about the uh, NPO status of, of, to the mother, explain about maybe, the... Uh, maybe if you want to impress your examiner, because we're now preparing you for the exams, right? Yes, you should talk about your patient, right? It's an 8 kg yes, patient. Yes, so yes, don't yes. just say, you know, I will reserve blood. You say, you know, how much okay. blood are you going to reserve? Are you going to reserve a whole adult unit for this patient? No, Please sir. 80, 80 ml. Yeah. So you must, for an 8 kg patient, okay, so you will say that I will either type and hold or cross match. Is there any difference between the two? 
for a pilot would you like to have the blood in the theater or if you you know type the blood would it be enough and it's available in the blood bank uh, blood bank is enough blood bank is enough no yes. so very often the surgeons are very adept you know very rarely do we land up giving blood unless it's a very huge defect and this child has only a soft palate defect yes. mainly right so very unlikely that we will need the blood so let's just you know uh, type the blood and um, the group in uh, rh typing and hold it hold the blood in the uh, uh, blood bank okay right then what else uh, since my child does not have any syndromes or uh, facial anomalies like yeah. uh, cleft lip or any other syndromes mm -hmm. so uh, uh, i am uh, giving pre medication i would like to give uh, pre medication like med uh, syrup midazolam 0.5 mg per kg uh, like you tell me how much for this child okay four, four that is more impressive see yes, you don't give general answers you are talking about this child weighing 8 kilos coming for cleft palate repair it would be more appropriate if you say okay i'll four give cleft, four mg Four milligrams you want to give, okay? Yes, sir. Point five milligram per kilo, okay? So I, you can say I'll give point five milligram per kilo. Five milligram time. of uh, midazolam, forty-five minutes before uh, induction of uh, anesthesia. Uh, Do you then... think it's mandatory? Do you think this child is going to have uh, separation anxiety? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, children more than six months need. Uh, because of the uh, stranger anxiety will develop in six months of age, so uh, any child more than six months require. Are you a little concerned about giving sedative pre-medication children with clefts? Uh, if you are anticipating a difficult airway, better not to give uh, sedative pre-medication. Okay, so it depends. So in your evaluation, this child is not likely to have an, a difficult airway. Is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. Okay. What in the history will tell you that there's likely to be a difficulty? What do the mother uh, tell you? If the child has uh, uh, cyanosis uh, during feeding, uh, there is uh, in cyanosis or uh, increased uh, sweating or like any congenital anomalies, and also uh, during sleep, the pa patient has sleep apnea, histories of apnea, okay. and change in posture will uh, relieve the uh, symptom. Okay, right. Okay, go ahead. Unless Dr. Uh, Kurdeep wants to ask something about the pre-op preparation, go ahead. So uh, one more, uh, just uh, just wanted to tell her that you know all pediatric patients in the examination, you should always you know note also that the IV line, whether yes, yeah you have a good IV line, you are allowed to mark it, and then you have to tell the examiner that I have found a very good IV line, and uh, that will be there or a vein for cannulating the child because it is very important. You have to mark it, and then you have to tell the concerned ward sister also not to manipulate it. Because many times you would have marked and she would have taken that uh, line uh, for uh, you know some blood uh, drawing the blood or anything, so it's very important. This is you have to you know in adult patients you don't do this, but in pediatric patients you always look for a vein for your cannulation during your anesthesia. So that's why it's very important during examination you should always do. Okay, uh, in preparation uh, you said that medicalam is fine. Okay. Any other, uh, you know, better uh, pre-medicants you can give other than medicalam alone? Uh, Trichloroforce can be given seven, uh, like uh, five, uh, 600 mg to this okay. child. Now, what is the common, uh, uh, you know, uh, pre-medicant you are using in your hospital? Uh, here we are giving trichloroforce. Trichloroforce. Okay. Yes. Any promethazine is better? Uh, what are the advantages of promethazine as a pre-medicant in a child? That will relieve uh, nausea. Yeah, there are multiple advantages, isn't it? Sometimes you may be asked, like it also has, you know, it is uh, sedative, it is anxiolytic, it is anti-emetic, it is anticholinergic. That is very, very important in this and also has got anti-histaminic properties. So multiple advantages are there with the Phenarcan syrup. So you can definitely, you can also use 0.5 to 1 milligram per kg body weight of phenargan, that is promethazine hydrochloride. But whatever that is being used in our hospital, you should always tell. Yes, Not for the sake of examination, you want to change it. So if you're using triclofos, fine, that is also good. Right. Yes, sir. Okay, go ahead. So this child is now uh, asleep with your pre-medication outside the operating room. Okay, and you've got your operating room ready. Uh, would you tell us what you'd like to keep ready in the operating room before you ship the child in? 
okay uh, i would like to uh, first uh, check the machine section uh, section and uh, keep ready the section uh, apparatus and the fluid warmer and uh, the forced air warmer should be ready and the operation room should be warm uh, then uh, lms uh, difficult pediatric difficult airway card should be uh, available in the uh, operation theater including uh, the different size uh, or a pharyngeal airways uh, different uh, one and a half and two size lma classic lma uh, buji uh jet ventilator and all uh, in my child case there is uh, uh, it is not uh, a very anticipated difficult airway but even then uh, we need to get ready the uh, pediatric difficult airway kit in the uh, ot uh, then uh, the jackson rees uh, i will be uh, using the jackson rees uh, modified uh, uh, like uh, istp uh, circuit and also the closed circuit should be uh, available uh, then uh, the monitors uh, should all be ready and uh, i will prepare the uh, uh, fluid like uh, since my child is 8 kg i will uh, uh, calculate the fluid like the maintenance fluid of 32 uh, ml and with the uh, deficit correction uh, the uh, iv fluid will be ring lactate will be uh, preset with the burette uh, uh, like when the child is getting the uh, ot after the iv cannulation i should directly connect the iv fluid uh, then uh, uh, Then, when will you allow the last uh, feed? Uh, like four when click. When can I feed the child? Yes, sir. Eight four... o'clock surgery, eight a.m. surgery. When will you allow the last feed? Like clear fruits can be given uh, till six a.m. No, no. Don't talk about clear fruits, solids, and all that. This child, ten month old, mother is breastfeeding. Wants to know okay. when can I four... feed the child last? Uh, four a.m. Till four a.m. She can breastfeed the child. Okay. After the surgeries. After that, if the child is still hungry and uh, crying, you know, then you can. probably give you clear, clear fluid still 6 am after 6 am so 2 hours before is what you're saying 2 hours before the surgery you can give clear fluids and breast milk you're saying up to 4 hours before 4 hours before the surgery is that the current recommendation a clear fluids can be given up to 1 hour before the surgery uh, and uh, is breast milk equal to cow's milk no sir cow's milk should be uh, uh, faster the child should not be should be uh, given cow's milk only till 2 am Like six hours before the surgery, it should be hot. Longer hours. fasting would be given. That's what you're saying. With cow's milk as compared to breast milk. Yes, ma'am. That's what you're saying. Yes, sir. Breast milk okay. for four hours and cow's milk for six right. hours. So, okay, and your part is over. Unless Dr. Guru Guru that wants to add anything, otherwise go on. Now the theater is also ready, and yes, you're the child inside on a uh, patient trolley. The child is sleeping on the trolley. Okay. Yes, With your sir. Your medication. Child is nicely sleeping. Yes, Enter the operating room. What next? You're the Senior PG in charge, and you got a consultant with you. And the consultant yes, start told you to induce the case, right? Sir, correct. Uh, I would like to eyes induce. Closed, it. With my eyes closed, I should be able to imagine what Doctor Limbi will be doing in the operating room. Okay, to see. Yes, sir. That's how I understand that you are practically good. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Since a uh, child is sleeping, uh, I will uh, uh, like to uh, put the monitors like uh, non-invasive uh, uh, BP, uh, ECG, uh, pulse oximetry. Uh, and you make sure the child wakes up this is the worst answer i expected yes sir okay, okay you taken all the trouble of giving pre medication and then you trouble the child but sleeping on the trolley yes, what is sir. steel induction uh i will uh, uh, like uh, i will use the uh, jackson rees circuit and uh, pre uh, pre oxygenate the child with the face mask a little away from the face after that i will incrementally uh, give the uh, co fluorin and induce the child with inhalational induction Uh, once a uh, child is asleep i will uh, uh, buy this idea or would you go with still with uh, connecting non invasive blood pressure pulse oximeter ecg leads and waking up the child would that be a better idea or would uh, you know induction inhalation induction uh, and then applying the monitors would be a better idea what are uh, you do in your, in your uh, hospital at okay at least we need to keep a pulse oximeter and uh, if possible uh, keep uh, the uh, ecg lead before giving sewa fluorine this because there is more chance for bradycardia and okay. so we need to monitor so the child if you are the head in you can induce the child okay and your if i were your consultant i will just say go ahead and i have my stethoscope ready yes, in sir. my ears i can place it on the chest if they have a problem okay yes, sir. child with two or three breaths not going to have a cardiac or a respiratory arrest yes sir As long as the child is breathing smoothly and regularly, there won't be a problem. And as soon as the child gets quiet, put on the pulse oximeter. Till then, use only your stethoscope. Your uh, consultant can just help you by auscultating the heart if there is any doubt at any time. Okay. So yes, don't immediately apply all the monitors. So your monitoring will consist of 
Uh, sir, it all depends on uh, what induction agent she'll be using, sir. She wants to use cefluorine, she says. Yeah, if she is using cefluorine, absolutely there won't be any bradycardia or any problems, isn't it? But if you are using halothin, definitely you can have all the problems. So that's how sir was telling that if you are using cefluorine, you can always induce the child, you know, gravity induction or steel induction, and then once the child is sleeping, um, you know, quietly, then you can always apply the all the monitors. It is always there, right? See the place where I worked, uh, Limbi. We had a yes, pediatric sir. anesthetist who, if the child cries, a sleeping child is woken up during her induction. You would be sent out of the theater that day. Okay. okay, so that's how strict pediatric anesthetists are. So don't lose the advantage of a good pre-medication, right? The whole yes, beauty sir. of pediatric anesthesia is smooth induction and smooth recovery. Okay, re remember that. Go ahead. Okay, so now you induce a child. Child is breathing four percent cefluorine or five percent cefluorine with oxygen smoothly. Airway is fine. Yes, sir. Okay. And you applied, uh, all the monitors. applied all the monitors. Then next. Now I will secure an IV cannula okay. uh, and uh, connect the fluid and will uh, give uh, glycopyrrolate uh, 0 0.08 uh, milligram. I'm very poor at maths. Again, for an 8 kg child. Why don't you calculate everything for the 8 kg child? When you get a case like this, you must keep everything ready for an 8 kg child. Okay. Okay. Once again. Please tell me for an 8 kg child, how much of glycopyrrolate? Uh, 0 0.08 mg, sir. Okay. Uh, 0 0.01 milligram, I mean, uh, uh, milligram per kg. 0 0.01 mg per kg. Limbi, 0 0.08 yes. will be too much. Is it 0 0.008 or 0 0.08? 0 0.01 mg per kg, sir. 0 0.01 mg. So she's rounding off 0 0.08 to 0 0.01. Yeah. So it should have been 0 0.008, isn't it? Or 0 0.01. If you say 0 0.08, it will be too much. Too much, okay. Even more than uh, atropine. <laughs> yes, okay, okay, right. So, glycopyrrolate given, okay. Child is only breathing oxygen and cefluorine now. Okay, next. Uh, next, I will uh, induce with uh, uh, like uh, propofol. Uh, to, uh, 16, 15 mg propofol will be given. Uh -huh. And I will uh, check for uh, whether bag mass ventilation is possible. Okay. And uh, then, uh, since the uh, airway is not much, uh, like, uh, if I'm okay, able, able to, to ventilate, bag mass is okay, right? Uh, I will... Uh, you had already induced the child with uh, CO floor, and why again, propofol? Okay, uh, I was just going to come to that, but Guru Dutt asked me, that, asked the question. Like, okay, I was going to ask that next, after her remaining drugs. Yes, the Guru. So, yes. what Guru wants to know is, uh, 2 milligram per kilo is what you've given, 16 milligrams of propofol, over and above, a child breathing smoothly with 5% CO2. Would that be an overkill? Is it I will tell you. Okay, you don't need to give a full inhalational induction and a full intravenous induction. That's when you'll have a problem. So, yes. it. maybe you can reduce it to 1 milligram per kilo now. No, okay. But so why propofol again? Yeah. Was CEVOFLORIN not enough? I will reduce the CEVOFLORIN. And... No, why do you want to reduce CEVOFLORIN? When uh, you are inducing the child only with cefluorine and getting an IV line also, so why propofol again? Is it uh, does it help? Uh, uh, cefluorine. What is the problem with cefluorine when you handle the airway? Many times with cefluorine, what has been found is these children may go for sometimes laryngospasm and also you know the bronchospasm. These are very common with uh, unbreath holding or very common with uh, cefluorine. So, the addition of a small dose of propofol will definitely suppress the airway reflexes and it will definitely prevent these complications. So, yes, you are right in giving a small dose of propofol, but don't give full dose of propofol. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay, then next. Uh, then, uh, if uh, I can bag mask and lead the patient, then uh, I can. Uh, I will give uh, atracurium, like mesoril accent. Uh, 4 mg uh, IV and then uh, I will ventilate for 3 minutes and after 3 minutes I will do a uh, scopy with a, a one number blade uh, Macintosh uh, laryngoscope blade I will do the scopy and uh, intubate the child with uh, a, a 3.4 4, 4 mm uh, ray tube south pole and uh, I will auscultate for uh, the air entry. Uh, if the uh, air entry is bilaterally equal, then I will uh, uh, like secure the uh, tube and it should be fixed uh, to the chin in the uh, to the chin in the midline without uh, affecting the symmetry of the lips. 
uh, and afterwards uh, i will uh, pack the throat with throat pack uh, so that uh, the aspiration of uh, like uh, the blood going into the larynx can be prevented during the surgery okay limbi are you using a cuff tube or a non cuff tube cuff tube sir okay and what is the full form of rae uh, ring adder elvin tube okay if that's not available can any other tube be used uh, we can use oxford tube or micro cuff tube can be used okay you've seen an oxford tube no sir no okay so theoretically yes okay because in fact historically oxford tube was used first for cleft lip and palate repair and only after that uh, these rae tubes came into use okay for a short okay. while they also used reinforced armored reinforced tubes for a while conventional tubes were used right so all of this has been used to eventually we have now uh, settled on the ring adder edwin tube as a tube okay fine four millimeter tube okay next uh, surgeon ready to position do you position and you put a pack you said right yes sir you put a pack okay good next how uh, do you then... put the child okay so one thing sir here majority yeah. of the times the surgeons will pack the throat because they don't want us to pack the throat because you know this is a soft palate surgery so if you are packing the throat you you know that the pack may come in their way of uh, doing the surgery so many times the surgeon say that no no leave it to me i am going to pack the throat so i i think um, that is what routinely done for palate surgery many times but just make sure that only one pack is put communication with surgeon is important you don't put a pack and then surgeon also puts a pack then you have two pack. packs right okay So be very announce when you place a pack in the throat. Whoever is placing it, okay. Okay. But enough instances of throat packs being retained. Okay. okay. So right. So what's the position for surgery? Uh, the uh, I will keep the uh, body of the child uh, extended. Like I will keep a, a folded foam mat uh, to extend the body, and the neck will be hyper extended and kept in a uh, head ring, uh, so that uh, hyper extension of the neck. Uh, neck will be kept, or the or the head. Head head will be sorry. Kept head head know. will be hyper extended, mm -hmm. uh, so that the uh, the exposure surgical site exposure will be better, and uh, the bleeding uh, can uh, like the blood uh, can be collected in the nasal pharynx that can be suctioned out. Like uh, the blood won't go into the larynx. Is there any other uh, monitor that would be used at this point of time? Uh, entitled uh, capnography is already there. Uh, internal capnography temperature probe yeah i was uh, looking for that skin temperature probe. probe should be kept and probe also can be placed okay right okay yes sir ah huh. so uh, now the surgeon is ready to put in the uh, the gag yes sir okay what is the name of this gag that they use dingman mouth gag dingman mouth gag okay so what are the problems that we or what should we watch for as anesthetists when the gag is being placed and what are the problems that can happen Uh, during placing the gag it can compress the tube and uh, we, uh, or it can dislodge the tube so uh, while the surgeon is What putting and second one here second one i didn't hear it can dis dislodge dislodge the tube dislodge or compress the tube kinking of the tube can occur so kinking we should always occur. right kinking will occur at which point uh so by, by putting the can... gag as well as during opening the gag no 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 uh, uh, at which Anatomical point will the kinking occur. Does uh, this child have any teeth at ten months? No, sir. This child has no. Don't no teeth. Okay, but you can have a problem where the gag is uh, the the tube is compressed between the gag and the alveolar margin. Right. That's one point. The second thing is deep down, the innermost part, of the the uh, you know the blade, the tongue blade, which lies in the pharynx. Okay, that's the other part where it can kink, but. Luckily, we have used a R A E two, and that problem should be less. Okay. Any other problem? The surgeon is happy. He's put the gag and he's pulled it out three, four catches. Tuck, 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 tuck. He opens it out. What should you be watching at that time? Ah, uh, like ah, uh, you should be watching for the uh, kinking of the tube, so the airway pressure will uh, okay. rise as uh, also. So you put the patient can... on a ventilator. That yeah. means I understand no, you put I... the patient on a ventilator or your hand ventilating. Hand ventilator. Better to hand ventilate at this hand time. Hand ventilate. So that uh, we can assess uh, whether we can uh, able to ventilate. Very, very if there is any rise in uh, airway pressure or uh, rise in tightening of the bag is there, then we need to ask the surgeon to uh, remove the mouth gag. What else would you do, Limbi, at this point? Okay, the entire carbon dioxide, the wave waveform is good. Okay, and yes, the sir. airway pressure does not go up. You are as you are ventilating, you don't feel any major rise in uh, the pressure. 
the bag is not becoming tighter. What else can happen when you apply the gag? Um, you need to auscultate both sides of the lung again. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Dis displacement of the tube can occur. No, it can go into. It uh, can go into because you, it is hyperextended. It can go into one side bronchial, into bronchial or. Okay, hyperextension. Extension will pull out the tube or push in the tube. Pull out the tube. So the position of the tube can change, or okay. the. However, with the gag in place, okay, it can push the tube further in. So application of the gag, whichever gag they are using, can potentially make the tube endobronchial. Yes, you need to auscultate both lungs after the final position is done. Okay, and also look at your capnograph and airway pressures. Right. Okay. Yes, no, Dr. Kuru was asking about laryngospasm. Yes, sir. Right. At what yes, point of surgery do you think laryngospasm occurs most commonly? Have you seen a case of laryngospasm? Yes, sir. During the during the extubation time. Extubation time. What was the surgery then? Was it also cleft palate or? No, sir. Tonsil. 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 Surgery. Can we talk a bit about uh, now that you, you know now the rest of the surgery will go on? Okay. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do for pain management? Till now, I heard you gave propofol, sevoflurane, and glycopyrrolate. Yeah. Anything else you want to give? Uh, after the uh, injection, we can uh, insert a paracetamol suppository, 30 mg per kg. So, uh, uh, 240. Uh, so, 170 plus. 170 milligram and 80 milligram uh, suppository can be inserted. At least 240 milligram suppository can be inserted after the uh, induction. Uh, okay. And fentanyl can be used. That is uh, 16 mcg IV, like 2 mcg per kg. 15, 15 mcg. I will give 15 mcg of fentanyl after the induction. Can the surgeon do anything that will reduce? Infiltr uh, he will give infiltration at the uh, incision site in, in order fact, to reduce the, the bleeding. Okay. That is the best. If you yes, block uh, yes, no susceptible receptors at the site of surgery, that will be the best way to block pain or to give pain management without over sedating the child. Any other things, I mean, the fentanyl can sedate the child. Okay, Paracetamol, I agree, yes, will give good analgesia, but without any sedation. So I agree with whatever you say. But it will also help. Okay, so the surgeon must infiltrate. Uh, and what do they normally use for infiltration? Uh, they use uh, lignocaine with adrenaline, one in two lakh uh, dilution, mm -hmm. one ml per kg. Okay. And one ml per kg. All right. That's about two percent. You said no. That's twenty milligrams. Yes, sir. Twenty milligrams per kg. So you are giving one ml per kg. One ml per kg. You okay with that? Head and neck surgery, no? Yes, sir. Would that be, uh, what is the maximum dose you can use of lignocaine? Uh, 5 mg per kg. So you are allowing them to use 20, ml, 20 mg per kg. Some mistake there or you want to correct yourself? See, you said 2% lignocaine with adrenaline. That's 20 milligram per ml. 1 ml per kg, you said. Is it all at one shot or are you going to allow them that over a period of time? Over a period of time. Even then, one in two keep, like dilution. Oh. Even then, you need to keep the total dose in mind. Okay. Yes, sir. So it seems a rather large dose. So be careful yes, about local anesthetic overdose. Yes, Lindy, you can go up to 10 milligram per kg body weight for lidocaine with adrenaline for uh, infants. Seven. Okay. Yeah. Plain lidocaine, 5 milligram per kg body weight. With adrenaline, up to 10 milligrams, you can go for. Any role for dexamethasone, uh, Lindy? Uh, and for cleft palate? Like anti-emetic effect is there for dexamethasone and what else? Here, what do you expect in the post-operative period? Edema will be there because of the mouth gag and uh, manipulation of the uh, tissue. So surgery is there only near the very close to the airway, uh, actually inside the airway itself. So post-operative edema can also produce problems, respiratory distress for this patient. Yes. So there is no harm in giving 0.1 milligram per kg body weight of dexamethasone also as a routine thing. So at least just as a pre-medicant only, you can give once you get the IV line. Yes, sir. Right, sir. Antimetic effect also is there, no? For dexamethasone, yes. antimetic effect also. Yes, right. So you, you, you mentioned that you have come across a case of laryngospasm. How did you manage that? Because, you know, you could uh -huh. get it in this surgery also. So yes, sir. What, what are the precipitating causes for laryngospasm in this kind of head and neck surgery? What uh, like the uh, secretion or uh, bleeding or clot uh, in the okay. uh, airway. So that is similar uh, to the adenoid or tonsillectomy, right? So blood yes, can sir. Be, right? Okay. 
yes sir okay, then. Uh, then edema like uh, because of uh, laryngeal edema can be because of the endotracheal tube that is uh, placed for a long we are not talk, we're talking two different things now yes sir okay laryngospasm is it uh, uh, different to laryngeal edema yes sir yeah. so we are talking about laryngospasm yes sir which is a transient closure of the glottis partial or complete closure of the glottis due to maybe irritation caused by the blood or secretion blood or secretion right how do you detect it let's say it happened on let's uh, everything went smooth in surgery and at the time of extubation let's say this child developed a laryngospasm unfortunate okay everything went smooth until then what would you do uh, first of all i will uh, give 100% oxygen okay uh, then i will give uh, intermittent post op pressure ventilation with uh like if it uh, after extubation if it is happening then i will give post op pressure ventilation with 100% oxygen with a tight mask if it uh, endotracheal tube i will try post op pressure ventilation don't don't fall into the trap limbi this is the, not the right way to treat uh, laryngospasm post op pressure ventilation against the closed glottis where will all the air go subcutaneous subcutaneous what do you say uh, you are giving post op pressure ventilation against the partially or a completely closed glottis Okay, and you are ventilating 100% oxygen. Where is it likely to go? It won't go into the trachea. So, which other tube will it enter? Yes, go into yes, the esophagus, sir. right? Yes. So have you heard of CPAP? Yes, sir. Continuous post. Continuous post of airway pressure. So that's what you would do. You'd use a tight-fitting mask. Mm -hmm. Will give adequate flow into your Jacksonry circuit so that the bag becomes tight. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, and the sir. bag becomes tight if you don't have a if you have a manometer you can check it but if you don't have a manometer a tight bag should be available with i uh, give adequate flow to keep the bag tight that in, it will imply that the positive pressure is created within the throat and that generally will break the laryngospasm okay so don't give positive pressure ventilation okay because ipppv is not a good idea when there's laryngospasm just give a cpap of 3 to 5 cm of water 100% oxygen right it doesn't break after some time bradycardia develops the child starts getting a desaturation 80 saturation is 80% and uh, bradycardia of uh, 45 beats per minute what do you do next the uh, laryngospasm obviously is not breaking what do you do yes sir i will give proper fold uh, 8 mg per kg uh, 8 mg sorry 8 mg like 1 mg per kg 8 mg uh, uh, proper fold okay. i will give to deepen the uh, plane of anesthesia and i will it. try uh, whether i can ventilate or not even then if i am unable to ventilate then i will try to give succinyl choline uh, 0.25 mg uh, like 2 mg of succinyl choline okay so and then so uh, those, ventilate those. the baby okay right have you heard of last sense maneuver l a r S O N S Larson's maneuver. Something for you to look up, or maybe somebody somebody has been answering all the questions on the chat. So let's see whether this answer comes up as well. L A R S O N apostrophe S Larson's maneuver to break laryngeal spasm. Okay, if you don't know, look it up. Okay. Ah, somebody is giving the answer on the chat, but you don't look at it now. That person the right right direction. Okay, go ahead. Sir, time. Bye. Time up, no? Yeah, another two minutes. One, one minute more, yeah, one minute more. Okay, last question. Uh, what is the tongue stitch, and when do you apply it? Uh, uh, Postoperatively, the surgeon will apply it uh, in order to prevent the fallback, uh, and it uh, like, and it will be remove. Uh, it will be kept throughout the uh, postoperative period, like in the recovery room. And while the patient is shifted out the recovery room, we will remove the stitch, and it okay. will be uh, st uh, stabbed so to the chin. to so avoid the idea. most surgeons prefer to put a tongue stitch okay it's a very safe method to uh, to go by okay because anybody in the recovery area can just apply a slight tug on that tongue stitch and can relieve airway obstruction particularly when they have done uh, you know uh, pharyngoplasties or you know this is a soft palate repair you don't know so if there is airway obstruction at that point with airway edema coming in it will help okay so the tongue stitch is also very useful and uh, of course Uh, we must always remember about the throat pack okay once the pack is in pack must come out so it's always a good idea to post it somewhere on the wall of the operating room throat pack in throat pack out or put it on your anesthesia record throat pack in at this time out at this time so that there is a record that somebody has watched the pack go in and the watch the pack come out i think it's very very critical to note that okay okay we are done
yeah, my alarm is going for 45 minutes. Okay, so we can stop here. And uh, maybe we've got one more case discussion there after this. And Guru must be very tired today. No, 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 sir. No problem. <laughs> He's going on, like, uh, uh, batting with many other partners. <laughs> Yesterday, he's been absent. Like, Okay, Limbi, did you have any question for us? You are allowed to ask us one question. No questions. Time off. Sir, it okay, was, thank uh, you so much. I think, yeah. Sir, it was a so, real honor uh, to be as examiner along with you, sir. Oh, no, it not at all. It was a, almost a dream coming true. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank so, much, you so much, sir, for accepting uh, this particular, uh, you know, uh, Invitation. I must thank, very thankful to you. I sir. must thank Dr. Gurudat as well because he's always very good company to be an examiner with, and also Venkatagiri, Nazar, Binil, and Rajesh for giving us this opportunity. And Limbi, I understand you have another year to go for your exams. Okay, so it's too early to wish you for the exams. But anyway, when you appear for the exams, all the best. But she answered very well, sir. Very well. You've done very, very well. well, sir. Fantastic. Really, Limbi, congratulations. Thank you. Sir. Very good. You almost okay. answered almost all the questions. Yeah. Except barring one or two. Really very think, good. Uh, the take home here is you must remember that you always give answer for your patient. Okay. Exactly. Your patient's body weight. Okay. What monitors you would put. And you know, it should come in a sequence such that Dr. Gurudath and I will imagine that we are in the theater with you and doing the case. Thank you. Thank and good you. day. Okay.